So what is monastic life? Thomas Merton goes about answering this question in his publication, The Monastic Journey, defining it as, quote, a life which by means of discipline and renunciation delivers man from the heedlessness and irresponsibility and spiritual insensibility and lack of freedom which come from immersion in cares, pleasures, and self-seeking, end quote. He defines contemplative life as, quote, the sharing in reality of the mystery of salvation, end quote. This is not alone the Christian calling as Christ has fulfilled all. This is the calling of all humankind to give up everything for the love of God. And as all life comes from God, all life is of God. Thus, all beings are spiritual beings on a spiritual path, whether they want to be or not. To better understand this life of perfection, it is important to separate the lives that those here on earth try to interweave. There's worldly life, the life of the temporal and ephemeral, and their spiritual life, the life that is immersed within reality, yet sees it all through the truth of the eternal. Furthermore, there exists a distinct difference between a God-centered life and a God-focused life. A helpful visual for this can be found in the image of a spider web. A life that is centered on God holds God in the center. However, that center, po that center point is as expansive as the web allows. It is a self-defining space, a self-made space, a space which quite often overbooks its vacancies. And in a period of relaxation, that central point of the web may hold a much larger area. As other events in life, distractions, worldly desires, and emotional attachments become caught in the web, the central space becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And yes, while God remains at the center, the tide of importance within the web's current state ebbs and flows, depending on the external. In comparison, a life that is focused on God is to imagine the God focus as a flashlight and all that happens and exists is viewed quite literally and arguably because of this light. The goal for all Christians is to shift this perspective in this way, where even the peripheral is illuminated by the God focused light. And thus a God focused life is a life focused on the one thing that matters most, which is God. And God is everything and yet God is nothing. And this paradoxical cliche is understood through love. To clarify this, it is important to look at 1 John, quote, Beloved, let us love one another, for, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love, end quote. God is love, and this is simple, and it begs a simple description of love. For pure and true love is free of all attachments. St. Bernard talks of this, uh, he talks of true love and the renunciation of self. And additionally, and more commonly quoted, is St. Paul in 1 Corinthians. And so if love is void of attachment, agenda, and judgment, love, which is everything, is emptiness, which is defined by its nothingness. For love to be empty, it is free from the self, and quite literally, selfless, without self. To experience true and pure love is to experience reality without judgment, opinion, or internal dialogue. And it is within that emptiness that everything naturally exists. As God's nature is love and all things are from God and reflect God's nature, love is the true nature of all things. The Christian life is to live a Christ-like life, a God-focused life, a life of love, or as the late Father John Eudes Bamberger would say, it is to, quote, live for eternity, end quote. To live for eternity implies a separation from the ephemeral, and as clearly stated in the rule of St. Benedict, quote, your way of acting should be different from the world's way, end quote. And so spiritual life would be a life of the soul, but within the confines of the world, a distinctive separateness between the two, unified to create one reality. So true happiness, then, is not a worldly happiness, but a natural product of the progression of the soul towards its natural state, that progression being defined by love or selflessness. God is love, and humankind is made in the image and likeness of God, and humankind is also love. And if love is devoid of the self, then the progression of the soul to a Christ-like nature is the progression of selflessness. This progression works in such a way that the will of the individual becomes selflessly in line with the will of love and thus in its natural state and so then experiencing true happiness. I speak of this not in an idealistic and unobtainable way, but simply and plainly and intrinsically in relation to Christ's doctrine.
In the waters of Siloe, Thomas Merton describes love as the one activity that is the beatitude of heaven. It is, quote, the clean, unselfish love that it does not live on what it gets, but on what it gives, a love that increases by pouring itself out for others and grows by self-sacrifice and becoming mighty by throwing itself away, end quote. Similarly, Christ spoke of the narrow way, and the further along the way one goes, the narrower and narrower the road becomes, and the less of the self that can be taken along. The more one carries with them, emotional baggage, self-identity, and so on, the more difficult the walk until it eventually becomes impossible and perhaps painful to move forward without having to let go of more of the baggage of the self. Merton defines the contemplative life as, quote, a life that is devoted before all else to the knowledge and love of God and to the love of other men in him, capital H, and for his, capital H, sake. The one main concern of the contemplative is God and the love of God, end quote. To live for eternity is to remove oneself, in many cases only figuratively, from the ways of the world in order to refocus on eternal life, to choose the selfless path a path that does not glorify the self, vastly differs from the way which society and culture depict. In the Apostolic Constitution of July 8, 1924, Pope Pius XI said on contemplation, quote, it is especially expedient nowadays when we see so many Christians giving rein to their desire for earthly riches and the desires of the flesh, end quote. And how relevant still today, almost exactly 97 years later, Merton reminds us that, quote, to take refuge in our humility is to take refuge in our nothingness, end quote, and further defines humility simply as the emptying of self. If the life of the spirit is to be seen as a progression towards humility, then humankind is universally called to a conversion of manners, and that the conversion of manners must be seen through humility, so much so that Merton takes the rule of St. Benedict's 12 degrees of humility as synonymous with the conversion of manners, saying, quote, the whole 12 degrees are the conversion of the monk's manners from one to 12, end quote. He speaks of the conversion of manners saying, quote, that underlying the surface of daily life with all its faults and imperfections is an underlying good. And this underlying good can be brought out. The only thing that's necessary to bring it out is to remove the obstacles, end quote. The conversion of manners and spiritual life as a whole is a way of removing these obstacles to view life this way presents an unavoidable living relationship with the doctrine of Christ and how humankind is universally called to live. It is an internal calling to develop, uh, to develop humility, the loving act of selflessness, a complete interchange so that the good in oneself is surrendered to Christ so that he, capital H, can do what he, capital H, capital H wants with it. Of our internal obstacles, Merton says, quote, worldly standards imprison the good that is in us. If we can get rid of these worldly standards, it's getting rid of obstacles and the good will develop, end quote. Merton emphasizes humility as the key to, of, excuse me, Merton emphasizes humility as the key to monastic life, and so is true universally. It is a pathway to developing humility that naturally reduces the presence of the self, and it is through that that love can naturally inhabit the space left when the presence of the self is decreased. It is through renunciation, discipline, and contemplative focus that the calling of Christ becomes clear, to develop the internal in order to approach the ex external with love and compassion. To seek the love of God above all things is to act in true humility in all interactions. To change the world is to change on an individual level, not to live for ideals and abstractions, but to live for God in reality, both worldly and spiritually united. Because it is in the separation with the world that one becomes more deeply and fully united with it, developing a true love for humankind, for one's neighbor, a love for one's enemies, and ironically, a love for oneself. This perfection, Christian perfection, is, quote, nothing else but the perfection of charity, and that means perfect love of God and men, end quote. To live one's faith is not to hide behind one's ideals. Merton states that, quote, the realm of ideals is not the realm of charity. The realm of charity is the realm of reality, pleasant or unpleasant. He goes on to say that, quote, what we have to do is cling to the central reality, which is life and charity, and to have our whole being oriented to the kind of existence which is favorable to love, end quote. 
And as our circular path approaches the place where it originated, I reference the quotes that began this discourse. To place Merton's one-line explanation of the monastic life in a context that excuses no one, a universal explanation of the obligation of humankind, a life of love is a life which, quote, by means of discipline and renunciation delivers man from the heedlessness and irresponsibility, the spiritual insensibility, and lack of freedom which come from the immersion in cares, pleasures, and self-seeking, end quote. Love is to renounce the way of living and to align, love is to renounce one ways of living and to align oneself with the calling of Christ by adopting a contemplative life structured in humility, founded on love and focused on God. In adopting this way of life, one finds deeper joy and happiness that radiates from within and extends to eternity. And so to end with a Merton quote on Cashin's definition of contemplation, a quote that sums up in words quite plain and simple, the Christian life, the spiritual life, the human life, the contemplative life is, quote, embracing a kind of life in which we are progressively stripped from possessions and from our way of handling things and from our thought so that we are left, spiritually speaking, naked and poor in a position where we can be moved immediately and directly by God to the place that he, capital H, will show us where we can't get by ourselves, so that the perfection then is to be led to a land we haven't even sought." End quote. Thank you and God bless.